Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, hello there, you wonderful pet parent. Thank you so much for joining me on the Pet Parenting Reset. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher, and today we are talking about, where's my topic? How to keep an indoor cat happy. So I have my cheat sheet over here because I was making a list. September is Happy Cat Month, and so I thought that it would be fun to do a series of videos on all the different ways to make your indoor cat happier. But for the podcast, <laughs> I decided that it was gonna be better to put everything I could think of into one episode for you, not go too terribly into detail on any of them, and then break some of them out, the ones that are most requested by you, break some of them out into individual podcasts that go much more in depth, much more in detail into what that particular topic is or that particular tip is. So we have a bunch of tips in today's episode about keeping your indoor cat happy. And again, September is Happy Cat Month. So the reason that Happy Cat Month came about was to promote bringing your cat in for their annual vet visits, which is going to be our first tip for keeping your cat happy. But before we get into it, and we have quite a few to get into today, so stick with me. You are not going to want to miss any of these. Before we get into it, I do want to encourage you, if you like this content, please give us a five-star review on wherever you listen to your podcast. Make sure you are also following us on or following me on on the podcast and on all social media you can find me anywhere i am um, youtube rumble facebook yeah the podcast where it's all the pet parenting reset so make sure you check that out also on patreon at the pet parenting reset I really, really can't wait to see you join the family over on Patreon. There is so much wonderful content over there that is exclusive that you don't get anywhere else. So I do hope to see you over on Patreon and as part of the family. So as I was saying, Happy Cat Month was originally came about in the attempts of promoting getting your cat in for their annual vet visits. So that is gonna be our very first tip for keeping your cat happy, whether you have an indoor cat or an outdoor cat. Uh, hopefully your cat is primarily indoors and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later on. Getting your cat to their annual vet visit is so incredibly important. Even if you think they are fine, they are completely healthy. Also, as your cat ages and becomes what we call a senior cat, semi-annual exams and blood work are crucial. So here's the thing, cats are, in the wild, cats are both predator and prey. They are amazing hunters. They are incredibly amazing predators. However, they are also prey. And because of that, they are really, really good at disguising when they don't feel well. And what that translates to for an indoor cat is that they are really, really good at disguising illness and disease. So getting your cat in for their annual or semi-annual, if you have a senior cat, vet visits and having that blood work done is so important because by the time we get to the point where you are actually noticing symptoms in your cat, it may be so late in the game for whatever that illness or disease is that your best hope is to manage it instead of if we can catch it early uh, with their annual or semi-annual blood panels then maybe we have an opportunity to even reverse it so that is that could be a huge 
that could be that could be huge, right? For your cat if you can actually catch something early and reverse it versus finding it late once the symptom once you have already started noticing the symptoms. Now, the second tip is really we're going to stay on the same topic of illness and disease, but really pay attention to your cat. Understand their body language, understand their behavior. And you know, it doesn't take that long, but it can take a little bit of time if you get a new cat to start learning their mannerisms and their behaviors. But this is gonna be one of the absolute best ways to notice a change in your cat. Because if you do notice a change in your cat's behavior, in their eating pattern, in their bathroom pattern, that is cause for concern and something that you definitely want to consult your veterinarian about. Preferably a holistic or integrative veterinarian, but again, that is a much bigger topic for another podcast. So let's move on to the next tip for keeping your indoor cat happy and healthy. So many of the tips and topics we're gonna be talking about today are really all designed around honoring your cat as a cat as the species they are and not treating them as human beings. This can be really hard for some people and on the surface we can look at this and say you know don't dress up your cat as if they don't like it especially um, and you know just don't don't treat them like a human but we also want to think about as a species which they is different from our species how they see the world differently, how they see their environment differently. So we're gonna talk about that. That's gonna be like an, an umbrella topic over everything, all of the tips that we're talking about today. So I wanna really, I want to encourage you to keep that in the back of your mind as we're going through today's tips. So the next tip is about their water consumption. So cats are notorious for not drinking much, if any, water. And again, that is because cats are, domestic cats are, they're very most closely related to tigers, but when we think about wild cats in general, many of them are desert species. They don't have access to water and water that they do have access to may be contaminated. As cats have evolved, they don't need to drink as much water because here's the thing, they're getting their water intake from their prey animal. So when you think of an animal that a, a wild cat might be eating, a lot of that body is water, right? Just like with us, a lot of our body is actually water. So that's where they're getting their liquid and their hydration from is, their, is from their prey animals. Now, as that translates to our indoor cats, they oftentimes don't have that luxury of eating natural prey animals. So we need to think about the water that they're getting and to encourage consumption of water. So first and foremost, we want to make sure that they are getting clean water. They always have, have access to clean water and preferably a filtered water because a lot of places, especially I know here in the US, there are a lot of places that our tap water just is not good and not good for consumption. So providing filtered, clean water all of the time is crucial. One thing I will say is that Again, it's, it's an evolutionary thing with cats, providing them running water. So if you can provide them a water fountain, a lot of cats will be much more attracted to that than a still standing bowl of water. Again, that has to do with their wild ancestors. And the fact that stagnant water is oftentimes, you know, they will not partake. There's so much higher risk in stagnant water for bacteria. And then we think of, you know, um, mosquitoes laying eggs in water. So the, the standing water or stagnant water just may not be a healthy option for a cat in, in the wild, whereas flowing water is less likely to be contaminated. And also, it's a great place for cats to clean themselves because 
that whatever they're cleaning off of their body, whether it's blood from prey or whatever else, is gonna get washed downstream, so it's not going to attract other animals, predators, to their location. Lots of things to think about when we think about providing water for our cats, right? So before we move on to food, which is the next topic, let's bridge the gap and talk about how we feed our pets and how we feed our cats. So the container that we feed our cat in is incredibly important for a number of reasons. One, we never wanna feed out of plastic containers. Um, they harbor bacteria, they can cause um, kitty acne on, chin, on their chin, lots of other things. We do not want to feed out of plastic. Now, there is some debate out there of should you feed out of stainless steel, should you feed out of ceramic, what, what's going on? Here's what I'm gonna tell you, give you a you know, 10,000 foot overview. Ceramic is okay as long as you are comfortable with the fact that it doesn't contain lead or any other heavy metals. A lot of ceramics that are made in China um, may contain lead, so you wanna be cognizant of that. Also with um, ceramics, if they get any sort of chip or crack, that is going to be a place where uh, bacteria can can stay. So you can clean it all you want, it's just gonna harbor bacteria. So anytime, if you are using any ceramics, um, they should be glazed, of course, but any chips or cracks has gotta go because now it's gonna harbor bacteria. Stainless steel is great, except you still have to be careful. It needs to be a very high quality, food grade stainless steel. Otherwise, if you buy a cheap stainless steel that is not food grade, uh, that the heavy metals can leach into the food or water. So we still have to be careful of that. But in general, stainless or ceramic are going to be your go-tos as long as you're doing your homework and making sure that it is a, an appropriate grade stainless steel and ceramic bowl. Again, um, on the topic of bowls, whisker stress is a real thing for our cats. So if you have ever noticed, or you know, there are tons of memes out there that cats eat from the center of the bowl. This is due to whisker stress. So the stress placed on their whiskers from the edges of the bowl, pushing their whiskers back, is not allowing them to get to the food on the edges. They may not even know it's there because they don't see very good close up. So they, they can smell it, yeah, so they probably do know it's there, but they're only gonna eat from the center of the bowl and that is why. So what I do is I feed my cats on a plate. So there is no whisker stress involved. For their water bowls, their water bowls are big enough that it, when they put their face in to get the water, their whiskers are not touching the sides of the bowls. Those are key uh, uh, factors as well for whisker stress. Now, additionally, providing your pet, your cat raised bowls, also very important. Cats in the wild do not eat off of the ground. And there are a number of theories as to why, but one really great reason as to why in our domestic cats is because um, when we raise their bowl off of the ground, their, their body, their head and their face, it isn't down on the ground, right? It's up. This is going to improve digestion. So if you are noticing that your cat is throwing up a lot, especially around mealtime, try raising the bowl this is gonna help improve digestion in your cat and hopefully will help alleviate those not so wonderful throw up piles <laughs> that we all know too well as cat parents, right? So before we move on to, let's see, let's see, do I have anything else about water? Hmm. Oh, yes. Okay, so we're getting ready to talk about food, but, and we're gonna do a very brief overview of food because that could be a whole series of podcasts on its own and will be, by the way, we'll get to that. So don't put your cat's food bowl right next to their water bowl. Cats do not like this. Again, it has to do with their wild ancestors having their, if they eat their prey right next to a water source, that is going to 
that, that prey, the blood or anything else could get into the water, which could then signal other predatory animals to come to that location. So cats do not like to eat next to their water source. Keep these separate. Also, food and water need to be separate. Also, away from their litter boxes. All of these things need to be completely spread out and away from one another. We're gonna talk a little bit more about litter boxes too, so hang in there with me, guys. All right, so now let's get to the topic of food. Most kitties in the US and I think some other countries are primarily fed a kibble diet, and unfortunately, kibble is the one of the worst things we could be feeding to our pets. There are a lot of reasons as to why this is. In fact, we just did a podcast uh, a couple weeks ago um, about why these recalls, some of the reasons why these recalls keep happening on pet food. So I gave you like a 10,000 foot overview of uh, kibble production in that podcast. If you haven't listened to that one, I highly recommend you go check that out. Here's the thing with our cats, and we've already touched on it a little bit. It is so important to feed them a biologically appropriate diet. What does that mean? As close to prey model as possible. What does that mean? A fresh, raw, preferably balanced food. Now for our cats, balance is, balance in our dogs is important. I'm not, not saying it isn't, it is very important. But balance, when we talk about our cat's food, I think is a little bit different and a little more, I don't know, like I wanna put more exclamation points next to it because dogs balancing over time, I think works really well for a lot of dogs. I know a lot of people that do it and they can generally balance over the course of a week, which I think with our cats would probably be okay too, but cats are a lot more finicky. So if we can get every meal balanced, especially, look, it, there are some amino acids that are required to live. Cats cannot produce some of these amino acids, taurine being the one most notable and the one that you will find more often than anything else if you're doing research about feeding your cat. <clears throat> Taurine is so important, they can't make it on their own. It has to be fed to them as part of their diet. So taurine is available in animal flesh and meat. That is where they get it from. So feeding this biologically appropriate diet, balanced, fresh diet to our cats is so incredibly important. Listen, I get it. Not every cat is going to, you're, you're not going to be able to transition every cat. I'm right there with you. What we can do is work towards feeding a more biologically appropriate diet to our cats. This is going to mean <clears throat> ditching the kibble, right? Feeding high quality wet foods to our cats. When we can feed freeze dried raw food to our cats. This is actually the stage that I am at right now with my cats. My cats are all older. I wish I had started. I wish I'd known all of this information when they were kittens. I really, really do. I can't go back in time and change it. I know it now. So I'm working with them to get to where we need to be. They eat high quality wet foods and they are supplemented with freeze dried raw foods. And these freeze dried raw foods are what got my kibble addicted cats off of kibble and helped me transition them to wet foods. So, so, so incredibly important. I really wanna do an entire podcast about transitioning your cat to a raw food diet. That is gonna be coming up. If you need to reach out to me to let me know how soon you want this, cause it's in my list, let me tell you. I just don't know like, exactly where it's gonna land yet. So if this is something you want, I need you to reach out to me and let me know so I can make sure to bump it up. But it's so incredibly important for so many reasons that we've talked about already today. But there are so many other things. There are so many other tips that we need to get to in this podcast, so let's get moving into these other tips. Playtime. All right, guys, playtime is so important for our cats. Now. There are tons of toys out there for our cats. Some of the most simple things our cats like more than anything else, packing paper, boxes. I mean, 
cats, let's give it to them, right? My, cat, I, my cats have tons of boxes and they tend to sleep in their boxes over their fancy expensive beds that I bought them. And that's okay because they do still use those fancy expensive beds every once in a while. They're there for comfort, but playtime is so important. Interactive play with our cats is so incredibly important. The, so just playtime in general is a tip, but here's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll this into our next tip because it is part of a routine that you need to be having with your cat at least once a day, every single day. Hunt, stalk, kill, eat, clean, sleep. Hunt, stalk, kill, eat, clean, sleep. This routine is going to be a game changer for you and your cat. Here is why. We are mimicking what a cat would do in the wild. If you can only do this once a day with your cat, I recommend doing it at night just before your bedtime. That way your cat is satisfied through the night and you get to sleep through the night. So what we wanna do is mimic how a cat would interact with their prey in the wild. And this is where the playtime comes in. You need, there are very specific types of toys that help mimic this hunting, stalking, killing action with your cats. Just as an aside, I'm gonna throw this in. I absolutely 100% do not recommend laser pointers. Do not buy them, do not use them. Your cats just get frustrated with them. So no, I am not talking about laser pointers. However, there are some really wonderful toys that you can get and they are, I have a bunch of them linked in my Amazon storefront. So definitely check out the link, my link tree, which you can get to on the, uh, like the show notes, which is on my website, jessicaelfisher.com. So there are wand toys that at the end of the wand, you get this low profile, um, some of them are a string, some of them are more like a wire, but it's very low profile. And then at the end of that string or wire, you have a nice robust sized toy, whether that is um, like a fluffy toy or a feathery toy, something that looks like a butterfly, something that looks like a bird or a mouse, whatever that may be. And these can be actually a lot of times be changed out. Play, interactive play with your cat so that your cat is chasing around this toy, right? A lot of times what I like to do is I just take my wand toy and I engage my cat so they know it's time to play and then I just start running around and then my cat starts following me around. Every once in a while, you need to let your cat catch it, right? And then get a really good play session in with your cat, 10, 15 minutes, really generally is all it's gonna take for most cats. At the end, make sure you're, throughout you're letting your cat catch the prey animal. In the wild, generally about one out of three times your cat try, goes to pounce on a prey animal, they're gonna get it. So that's about the mix you wanna do. Maybe one out of every three times your cat is gonna be able to catch it. At the end of your play session, you wanna make sure your cat catches it. Again, that's gonna end your play session and that's going to be the kill right? That's going to be the kill part of this equation. Right after that, feed your cat their meal. This is going to mimic their hunting behavior in the wild. So after your cat eats, they're then going to give themselves, they're going to clean themselves. They're going to get a good cleaning going on, and then they're going to get a nice sleep in. This, again, I said it already at the beginning, so many of these tips that we're going over today is we are honoring our cat for being a cat. This is one of the, if you take nothing else from today, please do this with your cat, <laughs> right? One of the biggest tips. So let's also talk about, let's stick, stick to this um, hunting, playing, honoring our cat and talk about supervised outdoor time. So this is something that I have not done with my cats for a very long time and I am committing right now to starting it up again. 
Supervised outdoor time can be so beneficial to our cats. I talk about enrichment with our dogs all the time, right? And enrichment with our cats is so important as well. And there are lots of different ways, including what we just talked about in playtime, to enrich our cats' lives. And we're gonna talk about some more stuff to enrich our cats' environment. But providing them with supervised outdoor time, if you're, if you're able to, right? So whether that is um, setting up, they actually make these really amazing tunnels that you can put out in the yard for your cat to walk through. They're a mesh so they can, the breeze comes in, they're interacting with their environment, but they're safe. Or maybe you leash train your cat and you take your cat out on a leash. How wonderful is that? Or maybe you um, train your cat to be comfortable inside of a pet stroller and you take your cat for daily walks in a pet stroller. Again, they have mesh fronts so your cat is getting all that wonderful fresh air. I like the idea of my cat being able to touch the ground and touch the grass. So that is the kind of outdoor time I'm looking for and I'm striving for with my cats. But again, supervised outdoor time. It doesn't have to be for very long, but at least a couple of times a week would be wonderful for your cat. So let's talk about enriching your cat's environment. Vertical space is so important for our cats and a lot of cats don't get this. So cat trees are wonderful. Actually having furniture on the walls that allow your cat to climb up and get to like a nice bed area or a little hammock area is also wonderful. Of course, you want to always have at least two exits for your cat, especially if you have multiple a multiple cat household. You want them to be able to uh, feel comfortable and safe wherever they are. So maybe one way up, one way down. That way there's actually two entry or exit points. That would be wonderful. But providing vertical space for your cats. Also providing scratching posts for your cats. There are so many different kinds of scratching posts and really it's gonna be up to your cat as to what they prefer. So providing them multiple ways of scratching. Cardboard is wonderful, sisal is wonderful. There are a lot of cat trees that are just 100% carpeted. I don't think that's the best. Most cats are not gonna love carpet for scratching um, as much as you would think. So cardboard and sisal are gonna be our go-tos. Also, a lot of cats like to stretch up to, to scratch. That's a very natural thing for your cat to do is to stretch up and scratch, which is why a lot of couches tend to get ruined because it's a great surface for stretching those front limbs, which is actually crucial to the musculoskeletal health of your cat. So if you notice in the wild, cats often will scratch on trees because it's providing them that vertical um, that, that vertical area, right? And also it's a great surface for getting. So cats need to scratch because their claws shed. If you didn't know this about cats, this is incredible. Their, claw, their nail, their claws actually shed. So they need to scratch to encourage that dead layer of nail to shed off. That's a lot of times why you will find um, like the, you'll find little pieces that they sometimes can look like whole toenails, but they're not. They are like the sheath, the outside dead area that your cat has shed off. So, so incredibly important that your cats do get to scratch. So provide them lots of options for doing this. The more options you can provide, the more you're going to be able to protect your furniture as well. Okay, two more tips that I want to include in today's podcast. We're going to go through them very, very quickly because I think they each deserve their own podcast episode. So the very first one is to not over vaccinate our cats. I was guilty of this when I first got my cats when I was, you know, teens, early 20s. I didn't know any better. So believe me, I'm, I was right there too. I did everything my vet said to do. My cats got their vaccinations every single year. And boy, I wish I had known better because there are a lot of health issues, especially that arise later on in life, but some of them can arise at the time or within a month or two of vaccination that are a result of over vaccination. And I'm sorry if you're watching the video oh, that I'm like messing with my hair. I'm trying to keep it away from my microphone so that you can hear me. <laughs> so over vaccination, guys, I'm not opposed. I'm not anti-vax. I'm not opposed to vaccines. I think they serve a crucial purpose, right? Dosing is important because 
not all animals need the same dose. But again, we can have a whole podcast about vaccination. Um, but so getting their core vaccines as kittens, I think is important. I think we may be giving too many vaccines all at once to too close together. So that's again, something to discuss with hopefully your holistic or integrative veterinarian is getting those core vaccines in to your kitten, but being smarter about it, right? Um, being more intentional about when they get them and how much they get. And then what you can do after they've gotten all their vaccines the next year, right? Instead of just blindly giving more vaccines, we can do what is called a titer test to measure antibodies. Because if your cat or dog, by the way, if they got the benefit that they needed from that vaccine, then their body produced antibodies. So testing, actually, I mean, even within a few months, you can talk to your holistic or integrative veterinarian about the most appropriate time to test, but even within a few months, you can test those antibodies if your cat, it's, it's not a number scale, it's not, it's, it's a pregnancy test, right? It's positive or negative. If your cat has an immune, an antibody immune response to those vaccines, then you're good to go for many, many years. Some veterinarians would even argue the lifetime of your pet. So get that titer testing done. Do not over vaccinate. But again, we will have a whole other podcast to talk more about this and probably multiple because it's such a big topic. So the final tip, for keeping and you know making sure your indoor cat is happy and healthy is to reconsider chemical flea and tick medications, especially if you have an indoor cat. I mean, guys, let's be more cognizant of the actual risks to our cat and not just throwing the book <laughs> at them to make sure that nothing ever arises because those chemicals in flea and tick medications are neurotoxins and they can affect your cat in some very, very serious ways. So there are natural flea and tick remedies and I have talked about that a lot, but we can talk about it some more on a podcast episode. I've talked about it a lot on some of my other social media prior to starting the podcast, so we will definitely include that in an upcoming podcast episode. I did a lot of research on heartworm and flea and tick prevention um, before moving to Texas because it was an issue. I was like, I need, I need to be educated before we move to this area of the country that is you know, known for a lot of heartworm and flea and tick problems. So I educated myself before we moved. And so there's a lot, there's a lot that I can pack into quite a few, probably multiple podcasts on these topics, but there are natural flea and tick um, prevention methods. And if you have an indoor kitty, let's, let's think about the actual risk that your cat has to fleas and ticks before we just start throwing stuff at them, right? So that's another thing I really, I wanna plant that seed in your head. So this may not be an exhaustive list, but I think it's a pretty darn good list to get you started and really get those wheels in your brain spinning about how we can better serve our cats and especially our indoor cats, how to make them happier and healthier. Okay, I don't know how I managed to talk about cats for so long, and I didn't say anything about litter boxes. So here's the deal with litter boxes. You want at least one more litter box than you have cats. So if you have four cats, like I do, then you need at least five litter boxes. Another thing about litter boxes, and Dr. Marcy Koski says this all the time, if all of your litter boxes are together, like in one area or even in one room to your cats that's like one big litter box so that's not going to cut it especially if you have a multi-cat household if you have um, a large floor plan house or maybe a two-story house you definitely want to have litter boxes in multiple locations um, spread them around as much as you can 
A few other things about litter boxes. One is that I do not love covered litter boxes. I don't love litter boxes that you hide in pieces of furniture or anything funky like that. Here is why. It traps in odors. And as much as we don't like the odors, your cat also does not like the odors. Cats are actually very clean creatures and they are very, very sensitive to smell. So they don't like the odors either. And it it could be one of the reasons if you're having issues with your cat using the litter box, if you have a covered litter box, that could be one of the reasons. Also with your litter boxes, they should be at least one and a half to two times the length of your cat. Now these can actually be pretty difficult to find. Sometimes you have to get creative and make your own. Uh, the two crazy cat ladies are actually really, really great about talking about their litter boxes and they actually use Rubbermaid containers and they uh, custom, like customize them. So they cut out a notch in the front and kind of tape it up so that it doesn't hurt anybody and let their cats get in. So like the large storage totes, that's what they like to use with their cats. Also with cat litter, look guys, I'm not a fan of clay litter. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. When I was younger, like teens, early twenties, I used it. I get it. I'm right there with you. If it's something that you're using, I don't love it. Also any fragrances being added to litter is a no go for me. The more natural, the better. That's like bottom line, the more natural, the better. No extra fragrances or anything like that. So I have in the past tried so many different litters and right now the kind of litter that I'm using is a grass-based clumping litter. There are also wood-based clumping, clumping litters. There's coconut-based clumping litters. Anything that, like, if you don't know what it is, if you don't know what's in it, if you can't pronounce the words on the back of the packaging, it's a no-go for me. Um, the more natural, the better. I will also say that there is a, there, there are pellet litters and, like, different litters made out of newspaper and, like, made into pellets. If I could get my cats to use that, that is what I would be using. Unfortunately, only one of my cats will use litter like that. There's one specifically, and I'm not going to name names, but my favorite pet products are listed on my Amazon storefront. You can get there in my link tree. I think I've already mentioned that, um, but if I haven't, then you can definitely get to my Amazon storefront through my link tree, which is on the show notes. So go to jessicaalfisher.com and click on podcast and you'll be able to get to my link tree. And then subsequently to my Amazon storefront. Um, so there are litters that I really like, and there's one in particular that is a pellet litter that I really wish my cats would use. Unfortunately, only one of them will use it. And she actually, I'm getting ready to create her little own like sanctuary, and she's going to be getting that litter again. A couple of two of my cats are actually getting like their little their their own little corner areas that are all theirs but uh, sissy specifically will use this litter and she will be getting it again i here's the number one rule with litters and litter boxes your cat is the ultimate decision maker so it doesn't matter how much i like something or how much you like something if your cat isn't going to use it isn't willing to use it we need to honor that right like that they don't like it we need to try something else. Um, and as, as much as I would continue to love to talk about litter boxes, and I think we'll probably create a whole other podcast around it. Um, if you do have any questions or comments about litter boxes and your cats, please make sure to reach out to me. Again, Patreon is the best way to do that. So I hope to see you join the family over there. With that, guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today's podcast. I do hope you enjoyed this content. I want to hear from you. I want to know what on this list you are doing, what you maybe haven't been doing, but you're going to be looking more into it. I want to know, reach out to me on any of the socials. One of the best ways you can reach out is by joining the family over on Patreon. Search all the socials. It's the Pet Parenting Reset. Anywhere I am located, Patreon, Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, all of it. So 
With that, guys, I do hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you are watching the video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you're listening to the podcast, I do hope, if you haven't already, give the podcast a five-star review That is the and follow, follow the podcast. That is the best way to let your podcasting network know that you like and want this content, but also that they need to be recommending this content to other people because guess what guys, there are millions and millions and millions of pet parents in the US alone and how, how much benefit could these people be getting? How much, how much benefit could their animals be getting if we help get this content out to them? Share it with anybody you think needs to know this information. Level up, right? Become that 2.0 pet parent you know you can be. Thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to see you next week. Until then, give your dog and cat some hugs and kisses from me and be safe. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel so you never miss another video.